Welcome back. Miami has one of the more aggressive needle exchange programs in the country. Started by students at the University of Miami Medical School, the program provides clean needles to any addicts who bring in dirty needles. The immediate goal is to get dirty needles off the streets. It also keeps dirty needles from being reused, and that's good because dirty needles are a major cause for the spread of AIDS and other diseases like hepatitis. The legislature is actually looking to expand the Miami-Dade program across the state. So in a word, it is a success. And so it should be no surprise to anyone that there are some bureaucrats inside the city of Miami that criticize the program and would like to see it die. As 1990s Will Smith would say, welcome to Miami. Joining me this morning to discuss the program is Dr. Hansel Tooks, the director of the Needle Exchange Program. Dr. Tooks, thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. So let's just, uh, let's, let's sort of, I gave you a broad definition of what the program is. Did I state it correctly? Absolutely. I just think that one thing that people should understand is that the exchange of needles is only about 10% of what we do. The most immediate success of the program is the distribution of Narcan, which is the opioid reversal agent. And that's why in Miami, the rates of overdoses are going down, whereas in the rest of the state, they're going up. I liken it almost to the needle exchange is sort of like a way of getting the addicts in the door or getting contact with the addicts so that you do a number of things, right? You, you look at their, their injection sites to sort of see if there are wounds that may be needed to be treated. It also gives you an opportunity to discuss with them possibly getting off the street and into rehab. So absolutely. So we, when I leave here today, I will go to a free wound care clinic that the students have established at the needle exchange where we will do procedures, uh, incision and drainage to prevent more serious infections that are really expensive and complicated. There's also HIV and hepatitis C testing. We're able to get people into same-day HIV care, meaning in four hours after a positive test, you can be started on meds. And the same thing for drug treatment. If you come to our program, that same day, you will be started on medication-assisted treatment. So let's talk about the HIV portion of this for a second. Miami has, is it, are, are we basically number one in spread uh, in terms of the rates for HIV? We have been number one for quite a few years now. Uh, our rates are coming down in the city, but not as quickly as a, the rates are coming down in other parts of the country. We're about twice the, uh, twice the rate of San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, correct here in Miami. Right, over three times the national average. And what do you attribute that to? Well, so needle exchange is a perfect example. So most of the country got needle exchange back in like 1990, at least most major cities. So here we are 26 years later, and that's when Florida gets its first program with pilot status in Miami when we already have this, uh, this HIV outbreak, uh, which is basically what happens in Miami. It's not just an epidemic. I mean, we have repeated episodes where a lot of people are being infected. They're not able to get tested and uh, detected early. They're not able to get linked to care. And that's why it's so important to have programs like needle exchange, which touch people who are at risk and we're able to uh, detect the infections early and get people into care. I wanna drill down on some of the specifics a little bit more in a second. But I want to take a step back for, for a moment. You actually started working on trying to create this program as a student back in 2011, correct? Right. So the first study uh, that uh, I conducted with my colleagues to, that led to the implementation of this program was actually in 2009, where we were walking the streets of Miami looking for improperly discarded needles. And we found uh, about 300, over 300 per thousand census blocks back then. So fast forward to 2018, and my students have repeated that study a year after the needle exchange was implemented, and there are half the number of needles on the street. So it's very interesting that something as simple as needles on the street are what led to and catalyzed this movement to bring us one of these bread and butter public health interventions. But I want to stay with this for a second. When you say we did this, we being you and other students, correct? Exactly. And what prompted you to want to do this? What, what was it that touched you about this, that, or you thought about this, that said this is something, a public health issue, that I want to get involved in? It's, it's interesting. So needle exchange, I, I went to Yale for college and uh, needle exchange. New Haven was one of the first cities to, to have these programs. And uh, I lived in New York for a time and I volunteered and I gave vaccines at a needle exchange program there. So when I came to Miami and I knew about the, the epidemic here, I was very shocked that we didn't have one of these uh, programs. Of course, back then, opioids weren't the, the largest uh, drug being used on our streets. Uh, however, when I started to get out into the community and I saw the suffering and I saw how, how hard circumstances were for people who didn't have access to clean needles, it was something that I really wanted to do for our community. And that's really how it started. 
Now, I said at the outset that there, you've received some pushback from some officials. I know that a couple of years ago you had problems with the Miami Police Union president who thought that this was a problem program. There's, uh, there's an official at the city of Miami who's been hectoring you a bit in public meetings. That was, there was one just last month that that was an issue. Ron Book from the Homeless Trust has also been a critic at time and may have, you know, and so there are, there are voices out there who dissent from this. I want to I want to sort of capture some of their arguments and and give you a chance to respond. You sort of did a little bit. One was the idea that that the needle exchange program ends up creating more needles just left on the streets. So that's the most ridiculous argument and that's really where the one official at the city of Miami was coming from. He really uh, somehow he didn't know that there were syringes on the streets of Miami for the past couple decades. It was interesting Deputy Mayor Kemp who used to be a firefighter in the city of Miami even said at one point when I was working as a firefighter back in the day there were needles you know in many locations. The judges were telling this official the same thing. And when we look at the empiric evidence uh, there's actually far fewer syringes on the streets of Miami. We've taken in over 250,000 syringes. We've handed out 12,000 fewer than we've taken in. So that argument is just not. All right. So what? So one of the other issues is that you're creating a permissive attitude. That it almost suggests that that the use of of uh, heroin or whatever type of drug you might may inje inject is okay because the state is tacitly endorsing it by giving you the tools to do it. Right. So one thing is that our program does use private funding. So the state has approved of the program, but it's actually private funding that's providing the syringes. The important thing to know is that no person who's come into our program, it's the first time that they've used heroin. These are all people who have been using drugs for a long time and just have not had access to syringes. And I, I would love for you to come to the program. There's nothing enticing about the needle exchange program. The needle's not the rate limiting step in whether or not you're going to use heroin. There's nothing that would gravitate somebody to use just because needles were available. So let's talk about that right now. So now, by the way, the, the pilot program for Miami-Dade was actually signed into law by then Governor Rick Scott. Mm -hmm. How surprised were you that Governor Scott signed this into law, this pilot program that you're operating under now? The truth, I almost fell out of my chair, but I was very, very happy uh, that Senator Scott, now Senator Scott, uh, signed the legislation. Uh, I was actually on the HIV service at Jackson Memorial when he signed it. I got a text message and it said the governor is about to sign the bill. Uh, I was very happy, but we had spent a lot of time providing his staff with education, and I think the governor knew that we had to do something about it. And, and this truly is now a bipartisan approach. You've won over conservative Republicans, you, you've won over liberal Democrats, and everything in between within the legislature, hopefully, and you're putting forth a bill to try to expand this program now from Miami-Dade, which was a pilot program, mm -hmm. about 20 years too late, but a pilot <laughs> program, and now you want to bring it to other counties. Is that correct? Absolutely. So the version in the Senate would be an opt-in in other counties. So the, the county commissions would approve of, the, uh, of a program that's operating there. It looks like it's going to happen. Uh, we've been very fortunate to have a lot of visitors come to the program, such as uh, Speaker Oliva came to visit. I think it's very important for people to see what we do and the amount of work that we're able to do with very limited resources and, and see how we're helping the community and saving. And do you get the sense that there are other communities around the state that are eager to, to opt into this program? I know all of South Florida is very eager. I, I would imagine that those programs would start going on day one. But also Orange County, uh, the Tampa Bay area, Jackson. There are a lot of areas that are in uh, serious need of, of this sort of program. You, one of the th statistics that you, you cited earlier, talking about the number of needles that you believe you're getting off the streets, um, but uh, the one statistic that I found most telling was uh, recently you came out with a report that said 1,075 overdose reversals. Explain it, what an overdose reversal is. In other words, those are lives that you believe you've saved. Right, so we hand out Narcan to everybody who comes into the program. And Narcan is what you give somebody who's o overdosed and is actually almost near death. Exactly. So it's a nasal spray. I should have brought some for you today. I apologize. That's okay. I'm, I'm <laughs> trying to cut back for lunch. Everybody should carry Narcan. And the people who use our program, they are amazing. They are the reason that the overdose numbers are coming down in Miami. Because they have Narcan, and when they see somebody overdosing, these are people who are using drugs, who are using heroin, and they're saving each other's lives. And for that reason, Miami Fire Rescue has far fewer calls. And for that reason, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement shows that overdose those numbers are coming down in Miami. Well, so let's so let's take a moment and just spend our remaining time. When you, so you're you're dealing with these folks who are addicted to to heroin or opioids of some sort. 
Talk to me about what you see in them, because there's a lot of people who just view them as less than, as their lives aren't worth saving, that we shouldn't be making these efforts, better that they just overdose and die and not be a plague on society. When you encounter these folks, who are you seeing? Tell me about who you see. Oh, well, I see people, and, uh, and all people are, are valuable and have uh, every life is uh, worth living. I had one patient today who was sort of the, the king of 14th Street. You remember there was a, a large homeless encampment over there. And since that time, in October, he's been in, in treatment. And he came to see me today in clinic, and he was smiling that he is getting a job in Pembroke Pines, and he's going to be doing construction like he did before he got his injury and became uh, addicted to opioids. And he talked to me about talking to his daughters on the, on the phone and his one of his grandkids is going to music school to get his PhD. These people are able to reconnect with their families. They're able to have meaningful lives. They just need to be given a chance. And the problem is that nobody was giving them that chance here. So I'm happy that we've been able to make a change. And this program is a bridge for them in that way. That's really the, what this is all about. Well, we are the front lines. It's interesting because one of our, our most natural allies now is the Miami Police Department. They are so supportive, and we are both sitting on the front lines of this epidemic. And it's because we understand that, you know, these people are down, and they just need help. They just need help. They, they need a helping hand, and our program is one of the easiest, most comfortable places for them to come get that helping hand. Dr. Hansel Tooks, I really appreciate your coming in. I'll take you up on that. I'd like to go out with you guys. Soon. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much.